Thank you so much for uh, allowing me the opportunity, first of all, to come to your beautiful country of New Zealand. It's been on my bucket list to, to come here. I actually uh, employ two New Zealanders in my practice, uh, or I have in the past. They, one has moved on, and, um, and uh, wonderful ladies, brilliant personalities. And uh, when, I, when I came here, uh, I really feel right at home. Uh, we're from a, a region of um, Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky known as the tri-state region that uh, Appalachian people are a lot like you, kind of laid back and easy to get along with for the most part. And I've been welcomed with such warm uh, hospitality that uh, you know it's not like I'm in a, on the other side of the world. And uh, I've had a few adjustments to make. Um, uh, one is I'm trying to figure out if you guys talk funny or if I talk funny. So <laughs> I'm not sure which one it is. I think it's me because uh, we're known as hillbillies where I come from, and it's uh, a little bit of a, a dialect that we get made fun of back home. But um, the other thing is, is I've had to walk around vehicles two or three times to figure out which side to get in because you guys get it, have, you drive from the other side. And then another little uh, stumbling block was I went to the uh, fitness center at the Heritage Hotel in uh, Christ Church the other morning. And it says, uh, you know, enter your body weight. So I type in 200. And uh, uh, not quite realizing that you guys are in kilograms. Uh, so the little uh, screen monitor there said, one at a time, please. And so, uh, so, I've, <laughs> so I've had a few adjustments to make. I didn't realize a 200 kilogram guy was probably a pretty hefty fellow. But uh, nonetheless, it's been a great week. It's been a busy week. Uh, we gave this talk for the first time ever in Christchurch and got a warm reception there. And then last night in, in Wellington, and I've been able to visit practices during the day. And wow, there's so many similarities, but yet there are so many differences in your practice models that it's really challenged my way of thinking. So I've learned as much probably that, you know, as, as you might learn from me. And um, you know, that's what makes this a nice thing is we can you know, gather from around the world and share ideas. And uh, we're facing some big challenges in our profession in the States. And, um, you might be facing those too in the near future, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the inside out uh, comment that I'll re refer to, and I hope this picture doesn't offend anybody, I just thought it really drove home the point that, um, you know, there's a book that I read one time called Acres of Diamonds. And in that book, there was a story about a farmer that was always looking to obtain his fortune somewhere else. Um, you know, he went to foreign lands and tried to uh, discover something or to hope to uh, gain his fortune whatnot and he was so eager to find his fortune somewhere else that he, he sold his farm and then he moved off and then the guy that bought his farm was plowing the field one day and uncovered acres of diamonds <laughs> and so uh, the point being there is that in our practices we have a already have an existing database of clients and Fritz Wood is a, a well-known practice manager speaker in the states and he he made a comment one time in a meeting one time that really got my attention. He said, you could double your revenue with your existing client base. And that really had me scratch, scratch my head and thinking, you know, how do you do that? And, but I want to, if I just leave you with one comment or a phrase, you know, you've been to continuing education, you get all these ideas and you go home and you never implement them. <laughs> you know, you try to, or you might get one thing done. But, you know, I, I, I love education and, and I just hope that this hour gives you something that you, real that you can take back to your practice to make a difference. And uh, that's really what my goal is here this evening. So the challenge is, I want to ask you guys this, and the fact that you're here tonight, really, I know the answer, but let's just go through this. Have you really reached your practice potential? Um, you know, are you practicing the very best medicine? If you think you are, then, you know, you probably are, really aren't. Um, but, the, you know, you, are you overflowing with abundance of income? And have you reached all of your goals and living a fulfilled life? Well, if we were all of those things, we really wouldn't have a need for existing. You know, I was brought up to think that when you're through improving, you're through. And so um, the fact that you're here to learn and to, to promote your profession and to do better tells me that, you know, no, you really haven't reached your practice potential. And, and we all know that there's acres of diamonds, you know, ahead of us if we just have a positive attitude and look at it that way. But on the gloom and doom side, um, and I'm not a gloom and doom kind of guy, but I, I found this nice ugly picture with this dirty road going back through there to just bring home the point that the, the veterinary industry is really under attack, especially in the United States, I feel. I, I'll at least know about it there. But the world economy has taken an impact. Some of the equine practices have shut down in Lexington. 
Small animal practices have closed. Um, there's just a lot of factors that we're looking at. Low cost uh, spay and neuter clinics and vaccine clinics have, um, you know, changed how we have to practice. Um, there's actually a bill in the U.S. Congress right now that, and it's sponsored by Walmart and the big box stores in our, in our, in our country, forcing veterinarians to have to write prescriptions or write scripts for their medications so that the pet owner <coughs> has choices to go and try to purchase those elsewhere cheaper. And Walmart will sometimes offer $4 prescriptions or even pr free prescriptions. And, and we just can't compete with free. But they'll use that as a loss leader to get you in the store so you, know, you fill up your buggy with bread and milk and all the other consumables that, that they do. So we're battling that. And we're slowly losing our pharmacy revenue. And other indications, the online pharmacies, PetMed Express is huge. We get requests in our practice every day for you know, Remedil and of course, you don't have heartworms, and I don't know how you manage to practice without having some heartworms in your, in your country. Uh, we've lived on the heartworm preventative. We've ridden that pony for a long time. But um, as a matter of fact, I hate to even say this, but there was the discussion this week about me importing some dogs that were heartworm positive and a few cans of mosquitoes to help propagate that disease so you guys could have a little boost in your economy. But that was pretty morbid. But anyway, the heartworm disease is an issue, but, but the pharmacy component, we're we're losing that to competitors. Our veterinary schools have increased enrollment by 20%, every one of them. And uh, I just uh, celebrated my 20 year vet school reunion at Ohio State. And uh, they uh, serve on a board there uh, of advancement for the college. And they have increased from 130 students graduating per year to 162. So there's gonna be a whole lot more of us in the marketplace looking for jobs. Uh, you know, kind of devaluing the, you know, perhaps the, the salaries and, and all that that veterinarians make. And then Bayer did a huge uh, study with BRAC Consulting and uh, North uh, American something for, to study economic issues, NCVEI. And they found that even pre-recession, that veterinary visits are taking a slow decline. People are coming into our practices less and less. And I don't know if that trend is also true here in New Zealand, but in the United States, we've seen a decline. And I've been thinking about why that's happening. And this is my opinion, there's no data to prove this, but practice managers has been telling us for a long time to raise your prices, you need to raise your prices. And I think we did. <laughs> the problem is, is we failed to communicate the value of our service as we did that. And we, we used the wrong models to get people into our practices like vaccine and uh, reminders and things like that. So, Anyway, with veterinary visits down and all these other factors, um, we're facing some real challenges. So we know, obviously, that change is ahead. You know, the world is in a constant state of change, but my concern is the rate of change is changing. And uh, we're gonna have to really be proactive and not just sit back and take it. And so what's our response? You know, um, my, my thoughts are, you know, we were all taught about the survival of the fittest, and I used to always think that the survival of the fittest meant that the strongest and those with the most endurance were the ones that survived. But when, in reality, the ones that survive will probably most likely be the ones who best adapt to change. And so that's just uh, how we want to kind of view this. So do we want to sit back and be the victim and be reactive to the forces that are coming against us, or do we want to be more proactive and become the victor? So our choice really is ours, um, and uh, you know, I think that you know, we have the option to stay green and grow or ripen and rot, so to speak. That's just a phrase we use at home, and maybe it's commonly said here. But I really feel like the future is up to us. We have, we have some choice. You know, we don't have to sit back and be the victims of what's coming at us. We have, some, we have something to say about it. But here's a little bit about that study, and I don't want to spend too much time on the details. Um, and this, these kind of things tell me that there's opportunity. And um, pet owners said that they would come to the veterinarian more often if I knew I could prevent problems and expensive treatment later. So 56% of cat owners and 59% of dog owners thought that if they really thought they could prevent some disease, they would come more often. Or if they were convinced that, that my pet would live longer, roughly 55 to 60% said they would come more often. Um, and Here's another, we gotta address the expense issue uh, because half of them felt like, you know, if it wasn't so expensive, I would come um, more often. 
So these things are telling me that we failed to communicate these things to our clients. We failed to explain why we charged them what we charged them. We failed to teach them that yes, we can prevent disease and help their pets live longer. And, um, and we didn't put the value on the examination. And I can tell you that probably 10 years ago, some practice manager in one of my CE events uh, said something to me that really hit home. He said, how many of you guys give free exams and then charge for the vaccines? I had to raise my hand. He said, why in the world would you want to give away the most valuable part of your training and your education and then charge for something that anybody can do? And that really hit home with me. And we've done that. So about that time, five or 10 years ago, whenever it was, I went ahead and just made the transition just because it bothered me about what he said. So now I charge $45 or $49 for the examination, and then you know the vaccines are minimal because you know anybody can do that. The low cost place down the street's given the shots, right? So it's, it might not have made a difference in my revenue, but it, 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 from a mental state, it at least taught me that you know my exam is valuable, my time is valuable, and I think that's what we have to stress. So there is room for improvement, and we know that <laughs> there was a study that AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association, did in 2001. It's a compliance study, and they showed that if you didn't have a vaccine or a shot tagged on that reminder that went to the pet owner, that 35 or 40 percent of people wouldn't even bring them in. You, know, you can't remind for an exam and get a good return. And so that's more evidence that we failed our, our clients by telling them that you know, the vaccines were the important part of the visit that the shots were important. Not that you're giving them a wellness exam and, and doing a dental exam and uncovering you know, potential cancer or tumors and whatnot and doing testing. So you know, here this other study kind of proved it as well. Pet owners said that they wouldn't take their uh, pet to the vet if the vaccination wasn't needed. So 41% of cat owners and 33% of dog owners. And that they would only take their pet to the uh, vet if, if their animal was sick. Nearly 40% of cat owners don't even take them to the vet unless they've got some type of an issue. And uh, of course the whole feline visit thing is way down and there's big studies going on now about how to make your practice more cat friendly and, and uh, how to reduce the stress on cats coming into the practices and what we can do to, to change that. So that's kind of a part of this Bayer study. A couple other things, uh, people want competitive product prices. We're losing product sales. I mean, we're hanging on to everything that we can, but we have to price them competitively to stay in that market. And um, here's some interesting things. Somebody asked them a question about wellness programs, build monthly. Looks like they like that. And they like this packaged health program put together in a, in, on an annual basis. And uh, I think there's something there that should give us a clue on you know, the future of how we do wellness, perhaps. And they liked extended business hours, and that's something that I'm kind of toying with in my practice. And I've seen some different models happening here with uh, extended hours and so forth. So um, that's all good. So the message that we need to communicate is, if almost 60% would come more often if it would prevent illness, then you know, we really need to talk to them about wellness testing. And here's the thing. I can remember when we first started doing blood testing like that, like pre-anesthetic testing and and uh, maybe some senior wellness, and we kind of started this years ago. But when I would get a normal result, I would have this guilt that I was ripping the client off because I didn't find anything. You know, here I spent your money on shucks, I didn't find anything. And so I had trouble justifying it, especially coming from a large animal background where, you know, I'm already feeling bad about having to charge them where you've got a cow that's worth this much money and your bill is 200 more dollars than that, right? So. Um, <clears throat> that's the mindset that I came from. But normal results provide value to the pet owner. That's, that's, that's something they're looking for. They're looking for health and wellness. You and I were trained to look for disease. So we're disappointed when we don't find disease. We gotta think different. We need to look for wellness and that needs to be our focus. And that's why the examination is important and doing this testing is really critical. And we know that we can find subclinical disease that we don't, you can't tell by looking at the pet if it's in early stages of renal failure or liver disease or whatever other things are going on. So we need to communicate also that by finding disease at an earlier stage makes treatment less expensive and makes our success rate go up. So 
these are some uh, things that I just want to try to change your mindset a little bit um, or have you rethink some stuff. So we've got to shift our focus away from vaccinations and stress this quality and length of life. And that's what they're paying for. And that's what they want. That's, that's where the value is. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my clinical history here. And this is my story. Uh, like I said, I'm a regular practitioner. Uh, I went back to the small town that I kind of grew up in. When I was in veterinary school, I had dreams of going back to this town of Proctorville that's on the Ohio side that, uh, because I saw a void there. And uh, I, I, after my senior year at vet school, I went down and interviewed with some people in that area for a job. And they said, you know what we're doing? We're getting ready to build a new clinic in Proctorville. And my heart just sunk because that was my plan. So I ended up joining that group because I figured I couldn't beat them, uh, being a new graduate and all that. So in 93 to 95, I worked for them. And then uh, in 94, they finished the clinic and opened it up. And uh, in 96, one of those partners decided to retire. And uh, I bought her half of the practice. And uh, so I became a 50% partner in a three clinic practice. And then lo and behold, just getting started, surgery numbers were coming up. We would do probably maybe 10 surgery, eight to 10 spay neuters a day. This low cost spay neuter and shot clinic opened up about two miles. I got to convert that to kilo meet kilometers, don't I? <laughs> so that's about four kilometers maybe or whatever, but a short distance from my practice. And uh, that was uh, a shot in the arm, so to speak. And then on the other side of us was a, a practice that had been in existence since the 1960s. And this old guy, the practice was paid for. And uh, I'll get you away. And, you know, I, he didn't care if he made any money. So here I am, a young veterinarian just buying a new practice, and I'm surrounded by these competition. So early on, I had to start thinking different if I was going to survive. And so um, what we decided to do, uh, and I, I want to tell you about my associate, Joe Snyder, is a year behind me in school. Uh, he's uh, probably the most thorough veterinarian. He's more of an internal medicine kind of guy where I'm more of a surgeon. Everything I am, he's not, and everything that he is, I'm not. We're exact opposites, but that makes a nice uh, partnership in practice because he, he finds things that I don't, and, and I can do things that he can't, and that, that sort of thing. But he always said to me, he said, you know what? He said, you create the practice that you want. The practice that you guys are in right now is what it is because that's what you created. You've nurtured a culture and an environment through decisions you've made. So what you have is the product of what you chose, right? You don't want to believe that, maybe, but, but it's just true. And if you want it to be anything different, you have to do something different. So anyway, we were faced with some challenges. And um, so we had to look at the culture of our practice, the quality that we wanted to have, and our clientele. And what happens is, is when you change your culture and maybe your fee structure and how you practice and the tests you recommend and the things you do, you find out that you attract a certain type of clientele. And uh, you know the people that wanted the free shots and the cheap spay, they went over there to the, the low cost place. I can't compete with that. So I just yielded to it. I said, you know what, I can't, I can't do that. But the strategy then really became kind of simple. Um, be the doctors and the nurses that you were trained to be. Um, and I was at another lecture and the, the speaker was talking about being a pet advocate. And I thought, wow, you know, I never really thought about that. But that's really what we're supposed to be, is a pet advocate. And if you're always looking out for the best interest of that pet, then you have a tendency to recommend what's the best for that pet. But coming from that large animal background, I'm thinking, well, they won't pay for that. You know, that little demon on the shoulder here is saying, well, they won't take that. They won't, you know, you can't sell them that. And so, and then Dr. Snyder's over here saying, yeah, they will. You just got to tell them it's necessary. It's important. And, you know, so I've got this, you know, angel on one side and the devil on the other side, torn between, uh, you know, what to charge and whether or not to recommend something because I was afraid that, you know, they would think I was trying to rip them off. And I think that that's a big part of what holds us back at times. So we had to learn to become less dependent on things that other people do and more dependent on things that set you apart. And that's a scary place to be, like that little fish that jumps out of the bowl. You know, um, it's kind of scary, you know, going against the downstream and all that stuff. So, but that's kind of where we were. Here's a picture of that old building, uh, Proctorville. Uh, it's 3,000 square feet. And that was supposed to be just a satellite clinic of the original mothership clinic in Ashland, Kentucky, which is a big, bigger, busier practice. 
so those owners had opened this with it just anticipation of it just being a kind of a, a satellite just to do routine things and then send the harder things over to the Ashland Clinic. So uh, just uh, in 2012, April of 2012, uh, we moved out of that building <coughs> into the new Proctorville Animal Clinic. But we developed the attitude of pet advocacy. We used a wellness approach as a model and I put the P and B on there just to remind me to say that we did wellness as a practice and as a business. There's still a lot of veterinary practices being managed as medical practices, not as businesses. And that, you know, that might not make sense to you, but oftentimes they don't look after uh, the financial side of decisions when they, when they, when they buy equipment or uh, you know, when, when they implement a program. And so those, those kinds of practices, you know, they're subject to uh, trouble when, you know, when hard times come. So um, we always looked at best medicine and combined it with best business and, and tried to make those two merge. And uh, that, that worked real well for us. But we've also found that you have to invest in human capital. And I learned that term from being on a school board locally there. But human capital means that you educate your staff and you ed educate your clients and you educate your staff so that they can educate your clients. And then you repeat that and you repeat it and you do it again and you keep doing it. So you have an environment of learning and education in your practice. And, um, and then we learned how to recommend services with conviction. Um, and I'll talk about that when I get to the five R's of, of compliance and, and practice growth. But then here's the next thing. The next caveat is, is when you start doing wellness and testing and doing more diagnostics, you start to find things. Then you gotta be a real doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta learn how to handle your findings when you find elevated liver enzymes and when you find uh, kidney disease. Um, and so we had, there's a learning curve. I mean, we, we learned it in school, but you, you get values that you don't quite understand all the time and you have to go back and be a real doctor. So we, we in a sense, became less dependent on spay, neuter, and vaccine income, decided to go the high quality service route. We created the image of being the best and not the cheapest. And the proof of that is, is all those people that went to the spay neuter clinics, well, not all of them, but a large number of them, they started coming back when their animal got sick. And they'll say, well, I got my shots down at the spay neuter clinic, but when Buffy gets sick, I'm coming over here to see you. And that's really where I want to be. You create the clients you want, you create the practice you want by creating the image that you're the best and not the cheapest. And then you have to communicate the value of your service, and then you've got to charge appropriately for it. Um, you have to study strategically your fee structure. Um, I think that's a, a key to survival. We're in a competitive market, uh, shoppable items, you have to make them somewhat competitive, you know, those phone shoppers. And um, we'll talk about the receptionist and boot camp and all that stuff, but um, gosh, I need three hours. Can I stay longer? Can I come? Would you guys invite me back next year to do this again? <laughs> but anyway, um, we had to make some changes. So we had a paradigm shift at Proctorville, and this is our new lab. And so that lab in an afternoon has one or two employees dedicated just to reading samples. And uh, this is another difference that I've noticed. We empower our technicians. You call them nurses. But I, you know, from in surgery, um, I do a little pre-op exam. Um, they've already done the pre-anesthetic blood work. Um, they'll bring me the results. Even if they're normal, I like to see the, the normal result and before we go to let them do anesthesia. They calculate anesthetic doses. They put in IV catheters. They induce anesthesia. They put them under the monitor. All I do is walk in and do, be the surgeon. And they recover them. They take post-op temps and, and um, extubate and do all that. And um, we totally empower them. And, and, and it ends up being a beautiful thing because when they have ownership in that case like that and, and they feel a part of it, wow, you've got really a valuable employee there. But um, I'm going to just take this opportunity for a commercial break. <laughs> but um, rim systems and abaxis, uh, you know, we have a hematology unit there on the left, uh, VS Pro, which is a PT and PTT and a fibrinogen machine, and my equine practice is pretty close by, so they'll, they'll drop by and do a fibrinogen from now on again. If we have a liver disease or a sample that doesn't clot well, if we have any suspicion, uh, you know, that a sample is not going to clot, we'll go ahead and run, a, run that. And then uh, this is our chemistry, the uh, VS2, and the beauty of that thing right there is in 12 and a half minutes, I can have a full chemistry panel. And back to my technicians, 
our model is the receptionist, you know, check the patient in. They bring the chart back. The nurse technician takes the chart. We have a compliance checklist that the receptionist filled out based on the history of the, in the, the old chart. And um, then she looks at that and it tells us if they've been on heartworm prevention, when their last fecal exam, if they're on a preventative, uh, when their vaccines are due, all that information that you need to know. And then the nurse goes in the room and takes a thorough history, does a brief nurse exam, flip a lip, look for dental disease, check the skin, look in their ears and whatnot. And, you know, and they'll record down, uh, you know, body weight and temperature and all that. And then they'll come out and give me a synopsis of what, what they've seen. And, but when they take the dog back for the temperature and the, uh, and the body weight, they're already mentioning to the client, you know, Dr. Dyer might want to run blood work today because uh, Bozo here is six years old and we have this aging chart that says that that's about 65 in human years and it's about time to start thinking about doing some wellness screening. So that technician's already drawn the blood and then she writes on the chart that I have a purple top and a, and a red top tube already drawn and puts a little box there so I know that blood's already been drawn. The client's already been prepped. Um, my receptionist actually mentions it first and then you know the, the, the nurse follows up and then by the time I get in there, in some cases, they've already run a, a full chem panel and a CBC and I have the results before I even see the patient. And so that's an efficiency model that by having six exam rooms, I can kind of float you know, from one to the other. I like this equipment for a lot of reasons. You can have a fractious cat and you only need like uh, two drops of blood. You don't have to have a big sample and, and it's very, very fast. And um, so that point of care being able to test it, it's, it's really good. And um, you know, that very accurate and cost effective. And my technicians aren't tied up with having to centrifuge blood down oftentimes and do a lot of, a lot of extra work. So I can get those results pretty quick. And then um, that data comes out of those uh, machines and goes right into this computer. And then it goes to the mainframe and it's in, you know, I have nine different terminals in the practice. And so anybody can pull up that patient's blood work results from any point and, and look at them. And then communicate it right to the client and, uh, and, and have that information pretty close. But, Joseph and Karen have been wonderful. They've toted me around in their cars and uh, got me to hotels and airports all week. And uh, gosh, w wonderful people. Um, and it's just been a joy to get to know them and, and get to know a lot of veterinarians too. So here's the historical hurdles. And uh, you know, we've come a long way. And I remember when they developed the first monthly heartworm prevention pill. Um, and they gave me the price of that and I'm thinking, I knew what the filarabits were, the little daily ones. I'm thinking, there's no way anybody will pay that for once a month for a one pill for, to prevent heartworms. And then people would come in and buy a six month supply like, no big deal. Or a year's supply, no big deal. And that, that was a real big hurdle for me for, for, a, for a while. And then we were just uh, discussing before the meeting about pain management. When I graduated from school, they, you know, we, we were under the uh, impression that we needed dogs to lay around and hurt a little bit so they didn't tear their stitches out. You know what I mean? Now that's malpractice if we don't have preoperative and intraoperative and postoperative pain management. And so we've come a long way. But I had mental hurdles because when Remedel came out at the price point that it is, and then Deramax, which is uh, like Prevacox, it's Novartis's product, and then Prevacox, and you look at that, the cost of those pills and I'm thinking, there's no way people will do that. You know, this old large animal guy is, uh, you know, taking a look at things from a purely a, a, a cow perspective, so to speak. And then this idea of using IV catheters for every surgery. And you might not believe this, but other than cat neuters, every animal that goes under anesthesia gets an IV catheter in the hospital. Every one of them. And um, clients don't bat an eye. And, and, you know, they can refuse it on the anesthesia release form if they want to. But um, the, other than some rescue spays and neuters that we do, we do some rescue work you know, to cut cost and uh, we, we don't put catheters in them and, and so forth, but everything gets a catheter. Senior blood testing, senior wellness, people won't pay for that. Are you kidding me? When you educate them about the importance and you share um, other cases with them about how you've uncovered early renal disease and liver disease, people want wellness. You just have to teach it, teach it is all you have to do. And you don't have to sell it, you just have to teach it. So we've got to become educators of our profession. 
Now the thing is junior wellness testing. Um, Dr. Talkman at uh, Abaxis, uh, he's uh, I think now vice president or something, he's moved on up, but he's who actually called me to come here. Um, his training programs are about, you know, his, his motto is every pet gets tested every year, regardless of the age, you know, wellness testing. And so that's my hurdle right now. I went through all these, this is my newest one. They won't pay for that. <laughs> so, and you know, in your minds, and, and especially you guys that have been out of school for a long time, it's like, gosh, I just don't feel right doing that. I don't believe in it. And, but I didn't believe in all these other things either. <laughs> you know, so the rate of change is changing. So what's next? Well, it's human nature for us to resist it, right? So the things I was, I was experiencing are normal, and a lot of you guys would face the same thing. Clients won't pay for that. I don't believe in it. Clients are going to think I'm gouging them, and really, I'm just so busy, I don't have time to do all that. Those are the excuses that I made, and I've lived this. That's exactly why I know it's all true. So then the critics will show up, and they'll say three things. You know, that's too expensive. That would never go over around here in New Zealand. I, know, I just know it wouldn't. And then when success happens, those critics will say, well, gosh, Doc, I was behind you all the way. I compared our two busiest clinics, the Proctorville Animal Clinic that, that Dr. Snyder and I are uh, presently managing and have been all the time, and then my, my partner's clinic on, in Ashland, Kentucky. Um, the demographic and the econ economy of these areas are 12 miles apart, so it's very similar. There's just not much difference in that. So here's what I did was I took our economic data from 2008 to 2012. And I averaged the numbers for all these different services by doing an income by treatment run on the computer. So this boarding value of $44,000 at Proctorville was a five-year average. Ashland's boarding, $108,000. So let's just jump down to patient visits. $16,000 per year average, $27,000 people patient visits. And patient visits, not somebody coming in to buy food. That means the dog came in for something. Okay? So dentistry, you know, we average a little bit more than they do. Hospitalization, um, you know, they're ahead of us a little bit, but proportionate to patient, patient visits, you know, we're, we're not too far behind. Lab and diagnostics, we're not too far behind there either. And I'll show you, I'll do a, uh, a comparison here in a minute on the next slide why this is so important. And um, vaccinations, heavily dependent on vaccinations, where we're significantly less. So he's one low-cost vaccination clinic away from a big cut in his revenue if one would move in next door to him, right? So how do you buffer yourself against that? Well, you don't become so dependent on it. I don't, I mean, you know, we still have vaccine revenue, we still preach it. We still remind for it. It's still a part of wellness, right? I'm not saying don't do vaccines, but it just can't be the focus. Or if you look at his surgery numbers, where was that? You know, if a low-cost spay-neuter clinic moved in next door to him, he, you know, that would be a big difference. So let's just look at lab revenue since we're talking about wellness. And I, I, did, this for, I did this for lots of things, radiology, and I showed how much more revenue they could, pr they could, pr they could produce just by doing with their numbers, you know, if they did the same numbers per patient visit. So Proctorville generates $13.80 per patient from laboratory revenue. That's everything. You know, that's uh, blood draws and everything. Ashland Animal Clinic generates $10.10 per patient visit from laboratory revenue. So what I did was I took the difference, $3.70. We're doing more on every patient in lab revenue. And I multiplied it by Ashland's patient visits. If they did three more dollars and 70 cents on each patient, like we are, they would generate $100,000 of revenue. And if you multiply that five years, half a million dollars, and if you put it in New Zealand dollars, that's about what it is. I'd like to have $600,000 in the next five years of high profit revenue. And um, purely because we've had to recommend wellness and, and more diagnostics and we're less dependent. Now he can make that shift, you know, if he needs to. You know, if he if he's if the vaccines are cut away from him, if the spays and neuters are cut away from him, he'll have more time on his hands, and you'll make a natural transition progression over to wellness. And so it happened to us because we had to. 
and we liked it better. And it's just nice knowing you're the best sometimes. So what does wellness mean? Well, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. You've heard that, or a kilogram. Is that what you say over here? <laughs> uh, but routine, well, anything, what does wellness mean to you? You know, it's more of a holistic approach to veterinary medicine. We want to be involved in everything to do with wellness of that pet. Uh, blood and urine testing. But all these things, behavior, dental care, you know, nutritional management, exercise and physical therapy is becoming a big part of, in the United States, about, uh, you know, recovering from surgeries. Vaccinations and parasite c control are mainstays. You know, we're not trying to get rid of that. We just can't make that be our, all, our, our whole wellness approach. So is sell a dirty word? Well, it's hard for veterinarians to sell anything, really. We're just not very good salespeople, especially if you're of my mindset. But if your motives are pure and you're always striving for win, 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 you're a pet advocate, then the sell is legitimized. Um, you won't be perceived like that. And we're always looking for the patient to win, the client and the practice to win. And then you start to build these long-term high trust relationships. That's that culture I'm talking about in the clientele. Your reputation increases, your staff satisfaction, their enthusiasm, they feel more involved with cases, their sense of value and sense of self-worth is increased. It's just a win-win for everybody. And one thing that I would like to say, and this is a quote that I, I can't claim it, but I've taken this quote from several different practice managers. We need to stop being doctors of veterinary medicine who manipulate our clients to buy uh, services and purchases to support our practice and start being veterinary healthcare providers with an extremely valuable service that will benefit our patients and our clients. And as a result, then, our practice is supported. You see the difference? It's a mindset. For so long we get wrapped up in business and we're manipulating the client to, to buy the wellness or to buy the heartworm preventative or to buy the flea product. You know, we manipulate them through sales tactics to do that to meet our needs rather than if we step back and be a pet advocate and say, I'm a veterinary health care provider, I'm a professional, and I have something that's really valuable to you and let me teach you why. You know, it's an attitude. Wellness is an attitude. And that's that wellness revolution that Joseph was talking about. <coughs> so when you do wellness testing, it opens up a can of worms. Is that a phrase you guys use over here, can of worms? Good. 28% of all wellness tested patients demonstrate at least one abnormal value that requires a recheck visit, further diagnostics, or immediate treatment. When you do wellness testing and you find something, part of the return on your investment is that there's always follow-up care. And I'll show you an example of that. At least 10% of all wellness tested patients are diagnosed with some type of cl subclinical disease. And that came out of a Vet Economics Journal article. But the scary thing about doing wellness is, is you gotta know what to do when you find something. Um, we're inside of a worm right now. Um, <laughs> But when you look for things, you find them. Now what? So more advanced testing, more follow-up visits, more treatments, more revenue, more satisfied clients. Um, you're a better doctor, better reputation, win, win, win. And when do you start? Honestly, puppy's 16-week last booster visit. My staff is trained to be drawing blood and recommending a pre-anesthetic profile does two things. First, we're imprinting on the mind of the client that that wellness blood test is important at an early age. So they'll always think it's valuable, right? Um, the next thing is, is I'm pretty much guaranteeing they're gonna have that dog spayed or neutered at my hospital. And they're gonna have it done within a month because I only honor blood values for about a month. So you're training you know, your client as much as anything that it's important. What's my compliance rate with that? Probably 50%, but my overall Pre-anesthetic blood work compliance rate is around 90% on all patients that go under anesthesia. We've just made it a part of our culture, and we've taught people how important it was. And it doesn't happen overnight. This is a progression over years of training and teaching. But you're setting the stage for future testing in the client's mind that this is now the standard of care. You know, at Proctorville, they draw blood, and now they're probably going to other practices that don't do that, and they're wondering why. And eventually, clients come and ask, you know, and we send reminders, and so they come for a 
senior wellness visit and, and uh, I've heard them say, well, I got a reminder for this uh, senior wellness visit and I need to get some blood drawn. They, they're, they're coming back and teaching me what they need. You know, it's, uh, it, it cycles back. So Katie is this five-year-old now spayed boxer. She wasn't spayed till later because on her pre-anesthetic blood draw on her last visit was at 17 weeks of age. And uh, her alkaline phosphatase was 1,088. Her ALT was 752. Red flag, we canceled her spay procedure. We went ahead and did a full chemistry and a PT and a PTT and that was normal. She had an elevated GGTP. And so she's been down back in our practice many, many times, month after month after month, monitoring these liver values. So serial blood monitoring, we did serum bile acids. Um, we did a liver biopsy. We sent her up to the university to an internist and they diagnosed her with a congenital liver disease, probably nothing, nothing concrete. But the numerous follow-ups and lab work and the bonding of that dog with our practice, everybody knows who Katie is in our practice. All the nurses, all the uh, the doctors, and um, because, you know, she's been there so often. And, and about a month ago, she developed a little tumor on her lip. And so, you know, we know that she's got liver disease. We checked her liver values. She's on Dinmarin and a special food. And uh, Dinmarin's uh, Sammy or Silmy. I don't know what you guys call things sometimes. But um, she's doing well. You know, her prognosis long-term wasn't good, but she's, she's now five. She's doing great. I did her annual vaccinations the other day. And, uh, but she's just one, you know, testimony that, gosh, you know, maybe pre-anesthetic blood work on a puppy is a good idea. We've got a client that loves us and a dog that, you know, everybody loves. And it's been a win-win-win situation for, for that. So the pre-anesthetic progression, this is just a challenging question on where are you, and I don't want answers. But you might be anywhere on this scale from we don't recommend it necessarily, we allow it, you know, optional pre-anesthetic blood work. We offer it and use a permission slip to accept it, or we offer it the option of accepting or declining it, or um, we just require it for sick or senior patients, or we require it for everybody. These pet aging charts and Abaxis has them, and that's in pounds, not kilos. But um, I used to have a, another version on the back of every exam room door for clients to see because they love to know in human years how old their pet is. I don't know why it's such a big deal, but Buffy's 70 years old now. And golly, this chart's so cool because it's color-coded. And for these younger dogs, a basic chemistry panel might be all that's necessary. And as they get a little older, we'll do a little bit more. And then you get down to, you know, a little bit more. And then, you know, level four is, a, a, you know, a lot of analysis and a lot of diagnostic testing. And when a client sees that, it's published, not necessarily by you, in their mind, it's kind of industry standard. Wow, you know, Buffy's in this green area. This is the testing that they need. And so Abaxis has these brochures that has that in it that you can give the client. And they take it home and mull over it. And, you know, it's an educational piece. And people, I'm a, you know, a firm believer that people retain a whole lot more of what they see and what they hear. Than, than just what they hear. It's more important for them to see it than for you to just tell them about it. So visual reminders and visual education is, is key for a lot of this to happen. Um, but it, anyway, eventually clients start coming to you requesting, you know, uh, rather than you having to sell it to them. Um, and, and, and really, I think a lot of this wellness thing is something that you have to tailor for your own practice. I've thought about trying to put together wellness plans and say this is what you should do. You really need your language on it. You need your, your uh, personality needs to be on it. You, you know the culture of your practice and you know what your clients, but what I'm challenging you to do is go a little further than where you are now uh, with your recommendations. So the roadblocks to initiating wellness, I'm gonna tell you that it's you only because it was me. Uh, I was the roadblock. Cody was a four-year-old male Husky, 88 pounds. He came in probably two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Torn uh, left cranial cruciate ligament. He's holding it up there. And uh, I recommended, my techs had recommended that we go ahead and get pre-surgical blood work and x-rays. We gave him an estimate on what the surgery would be. He said, you know, I'm not going to do the x-rays or the blood work just yet. I want to go home and talk to my wife and we'll call back and schedule it. So our intention then was to go ahead and um, Put him on Deramax, which is like Prevacox, 
COX-2 inhibitor for a week or so till they made their decision and bring him back in for surgery and do the blood work the morning of, you know, because we can do that with the, uh, the, the Baxis units. So we bring him back in for surgery. We do his pre-anesthetic lab work, and the only thing that's up is a mild elevation there of ALT, but just enough to concern me because I'm thinking, well, the whole reason I'm doing this pre-anesthetic blood work is so I can catch something. So I, I ramped it up then to a full chemistry. Turns out his albumin was low, his alt-fos was 464, and his ALT was still around the same. So now I've got a, a problem <laughs> because if I had been a little bit more adamant about running that pre-anesthetic blood work on that first visit, and said, you know what, let us go ahead and do the blood work before I start him on Deramax. Because now I don't know if his liver enzymes were elevated because he's been on Deramax for six or seven days, or did he have some pre-existing liver condition? I don't know. I should have done the blood work the first day. And that's part of my soft personality and not being so, you know, educating him on, on, the, on the ramifications of that. So we discontinued the Deramax or Deracoxib postponed his surgery, I sent him home on tramadol, gabapentin, and dinmarin, and when I get back, he's gonna come in for a follow-up blood work. We're gonna see where his liver enzymes are, enzymes, <clears throat> and, um, and then try to get him through surgery. And you know, if, if they're marginal, we'll probably go ahead with the procedure, but we'll have an aggressive fluid therapy plan, and um, you know, we'll obviously on a monitor and all that stuff, but you know, uh, so these are the kinds of things that you'll uncover when you go looking for them. So, why do stuff in-house? Well, that was one case as to why we should do them in-house, to get results on the spot. You know, a little higher patient care, improve, improved client service. Um, you know, you have the opportunity to educate them. Um, you know, it's just a little bit more efficient. You know, it's better for your, your practice revenue and all those things, but it's just good medicine. Versus outhouse labs. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not down on outhouse labs. I just found that cool picture and I thought, wow, that's neat. Because I kid with my staff all the time. They, they'll say, you want this in-house or outhouse? I'll say, you know, whichever. But uh, so the ones that go to the outhouse, uh, the good and the bad is, you, you know, you often have really good support with outhouse laboratories. You, we have, there's a lot of internists on, on staff at the reference labs that you can get on the phone with and help you with interpretation and maybe some treatment options. Um, then, you know, when we send a sample out, if they still have urine or blood left over, you can go ahead and add on another more advanced test or something on the spot, and that's really convenient. You know, the downsides are you've got delay in re result reporting. Um, um, one of my least favorite things to do, and I love people, but I don't like to call people back all the time and get into these long conversations. You know, the lady that could talk for an hour without a subject from the beginning, you know, you get those on the phone once in a while, don't you? But um, you know, you got to call them back and that takes your time. And uh, samples can get broken in transit. And then, you know, there's always a holiday or weekend and you want results back, you know, yesterday. So those are just same, some things to think about. <clears throat> I don't know if we've got any equine guys. Our equine practice, we developed wellness plans per se where it's a package deal. And uh, this is hard to read because they're really small. But basically there's two or three different plans. A senior plan, which does involve some blood work. Um, but like we want to get on the farm twice a year and we want to do their vaccinations, Coggins testing, health, rec health papers, um, uh, we want to float their teeth and we've been able to kind of capture back some of the, the deworming market because what we'll do is we do fecal exams uh, also and um, what, what we, our goal was there was to uh, package the wormers and put the date that needs to be given and give that as a part of their wellness. We deliver it at the visit. And so, you know, they are local feed stores and, you know, the, I don't know how it is here, but, you know, the, most horse owners and cattle owners deworm their own critters. Um, and so this was a way we could capture some of that market back is put it into a wellness plan. But Dr. Walker, my partner, runs that clinic and we really started these wellness plans back in early 2000, um, but we didn't know how to implement them. And finally, a light bulb went off on his head when he saw what we were doing on the small animal side as far as wellness goes. So he started really pushing them. And from 2008, he generated $6,000 in revenue just from selling those plans. Looks like he sold about six of them or maybe six or eight of them. All the way up to this last year, it's 95000 and he's even greater in 2013. Just because he believes. And he's got this in his uh, ambulatory truck. It's this... Uh, dry erase board that he pulls out and he teaches clients all kinds of things and education is a big part of it. 
and he sells them wellness, and, um, and they love it because they know they're getting all the vaccinations. They know they're getting all their deworming done on time, strategically. It's convenience, and that's what they want. And um, so for you equine guys, there's opportunity there. So this is a part of the talk that kind of supports the uh, not-so-clinical side. I call it shipbuilding, and it's just kind of a play on words. But um, this is Captain Bravo. Captain Bravo was a famous captain of a merchant ship back in the days of the pirates. And uh, Captain Bravo was uh, named that because of his bravery. But um, he would climb up every morning at, sunset, at sunrise and look out over the horizon. And uh, when he would see a pirate ship coming on to advance and to attack him to get their, you know, all their goods, he would look down at his mates and he would say, bring me my red shirt. And so the crew would bring him his red shirt and then the offending pirates would come on board and they would fight. And uh, Captain Bravo was just well known for being able to fend off the, the pirates and they, they, you know, uh, in battle he would, uh, they would always be victorious. And so afterwards, uh, you know, they were all cleaning up and everything. And then the next morning Captain Bravo got up, went to the top and here comes two pirate ships on the horizon. And uh, he looks down at his men and he says, bring me my red shirt. And so they bring him his red shirt and they fight. And Captain Bravo leads the charge and he's out front. He's not leading from behind. He's out in the front of the battle and his men are just amazed at his bravery. And, and uh, so after they're cleaning up the, all the spoils and all that, um, the men came up to him and said, Captain Bravo, why is it that when we get attacked, you always call for your red shirt? He said, well, he said, if I become injured in battle and I begin to bleed, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to continue to fight on. And they were just amazed all the more at his bravery and his, uh, you know, his uh, leadership skills. So then one morning they got up and Captain Bravo looked out of the horizon. There were 10 pirate ships coming. And Captain Bravo looks down at his men and he says, bring me my brown pants. <laughs> uh, leadership always has a point at which we get scared. And... Um, and that's kind of the shipbuilding uh, story is um, leadership takes a lot of courage. And it takes vision, but you set the course. You know, you, you choose the course for your ship that you're building. And uh, you have to train and release the responsibility. And that train and release is critical with your staff. And this is really philosophical. But if you want to build a ship, you can go into the woods or the forest with your staff and you can help them cut down the trees and you can saw the boards into planks and you can nail them together and you can build a ship. Or you can develop a leadership principle that simply states what you want to do is just create in them a desire for the sea. And what I mean by that is an 80-20 leadership principle that means let them do 80% of the development of your wellness plan. Because if they aren't, don't have ownership in that, it's going to be a lot tougher to implement it. You tweak the final 20% to what you want. But that 80-20 rule is, 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 is the way to really implement a, a, a wellness plan or any kind of plan or practice policy or whatever you're going to do in building your ship. Ownership, that's where the staff buys into what you're doing. It's really just what I just told you. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. Fellowship is nothing more than two fellows in the same ship. Um, this is Kristen and her little dog, Katie. Dr. Snyder uh, just last week did a Facebook uh, contest on pet lookalike. <laughs> <laughs> and so Kristen's the winner so far. But you wouldn't believe how much community involvement people get on and post pictures and all those immeasurable things. You know, practice managers always say, you know, if you can't measure it, there's no sense in doing it, and I disagree. I think there's a lot of things you do to bond people to your practice and develop that familial uh, atmosphere, the common ground, um, the, you know, those lots of immeasurable benefits, and we use social media and, um, to do that, and I'll share one more quick story with you. I had a Boston Terrier that came from across the river from another veterinarian that was uh, intervertebral disc disease, I assume. Uh, it was down, and another veterinarian had said, you know, told the guy that they just needed to euthanize it. It would never walk again. And it was a pretty old dog. And so I bring it in the hospital. I do some blood work just as a baseline. I'd never seen the patient before. Um, I put in an IV catheter. We start running some fluids. Um, 
it had deep pain sensation in both rear limbs, just couldn't stand and uh, acted you know, moderately painful. And really the pain I thought was up around the neck uh, more so than, than further back. And you know, I, I did what you do. I put it on steroids in hopes that maybe it would get up. Um, discussed referral surgery in an older dog like that, not really an option for this guy. But he's in Minnesota, which is 14 hours driving from my hospital. His daughter is back home bringing me the dog. And so I'm communicating back and forth well, don't you know it, the dog gets up on steroids and fluids and um, is doing really well. So I take out my iPhone, I click a little picture of that dog standing there all happy and, and I text it to him in Minnesota. I'm his hero, you know. Uh, those kinds of things, that immediate gratification and that, you know, we take photos now of patients right after surgery as long as they don't have blood hanging out of their mouth or whatever, you know. <laughs> You don't let your techs or nurses send pictures that look bad. But the value that people perceive by a little bit of communication tool that takes seconds, take a picture, text it to them. So we try to get their phone numbers, email addresses, and whatever, and, and they're waiting at home anxious for results. You know what I mean? So this wellness approach is being able to communicate what wellness is. And so we've, we, we still try really hard to, to work those bonds and, and use technology to do it. <coughs> Then relationship is the most powerful ship. Um, this is where you start to gain influence and high trust, and then it doesn't matter what you recommend, clients will comply. When you have these kind of strong bonds to your practice, um, it's hard to drive them away, you know, as well as I do, that you can euthanize a dog and do it properly and be their hero. Those of you who have been in practice, euthanasia is another area to bond people to your practice. And you show them the compassion. We send sympathy cards, and everybody in my hospital signs that card for every dog that dies and cats in my practice. They get a sympathy card. It takes a little bit of money. It takes a little bit of time. That I get so many compliments at the grocery store, out in the community. That card you sent was so nice, you know. But all of my nurses and, and receptionists and the doctors all sign every card. It just takes a few seconds to jot down a little note. You know, I'm sorry for your loss of Missy, and, you know, you had a great friend, and blah, blah, blah. But those are just little things that we do. But anyway, the relationship building, it's a long-term results uh, and benefits from that. This little blind dog's diabetic, and um, I, we weren't involved in the case early on when his eyes were enucleated, but uh, his mommy brings him in for his blood glucose curve, and that little turtle is a backpack, and it has his insulin and his special food. And his mom says, well, he doesn't have any, so he's got a little buddy that's got great big ones. <laughs> so... These are the kind of things that, uh, you know, this is why we were engaged in practice. These are the five R's, and on my outline, the teaser was, you have to be here to know what these are. And these aren't rocket science. And uh, it's funny, when I was developing this talk, I have like 40 R's words that keep coming up that involve veterinary practice. And I'm just going to develop another talk called The R's Have It. But uh, that's what I'm going to do next year when you guys invite me back, probably. But... Um, and I'm taking two weeks, and we're going to travel the country, just so you know. But um, the five R's really help build these relationships, and they help drive compliance, and they help drive revenue into your practice. And you're doing a lot of them already, but I just want you these to be confirmation of what you're doing. And maybe there'll be one tip in here that'll change your life. Your recommendations. You need to walk worthy of the vocation and the profession that you're trained to do, and walk in the authority of that profession. You need to realize your value to the client. And when you make recommendations, you got to make them with conviction. It's one thing to say, you know, we recommend that Bozo gets his teeth clean. Or you say, wow, um, I'm just looking at Bozo's gums. They're really inflamed. And, you know, that bacteria can get into the bloodstream really easy and can cause some heart valve issues and liver and kidney disease. And in small breeds of dogs, it's, you know, can shorten their life by a couple years. Bozo really needs to have his teeth cleaned. So if you, Dr. A did the little speech in the beginning versus Dr. B that just gave you that one, which one are you more likely going to answer yes to? You need to make recommendations with conviction. You need to believe it. And then, you know, you, you almost feel like you're acting. But, but if you believe it, it's not acting. You're just, you're, you're conveying the importance of that dental, okay? You got to believe it. Your staff has to believe it. And, and not to bring uh, Christianity or scripture or whatever, but there's a scripture that says that one man plants, 
one waters and God brings the increase. And that just came to my mind because I got to thinking about our model. Our receptionist plants the seed. Our nurse waters the seed. By the time the doctor comes in, it's an easy conversion, right? It's, it's easy to sell it. Um, so that three-tiered approach is really a big part of what makes wellness work. Walk in the authority of your title. They came to you for advice. You didn't go out and drag them into your clinic. They're looking for wellness. Don't prejudge a client's ability or desire to pay for recommended services. This is a walk-in closet for two little girls. If they'll pay for that, <laughs> what will they pay for wellness? This lady gets up every day and dresses these two dogs in those outfits. She washes them and irons them. These are her babies. They're in that 60-year-old clinic that was down the street from me. The reason I got that picture is we bought that clinic in January. And we've implemented wellness. And I get emotional talking about it. But that clinic's exploding now because we're teaching clients uh, about how to, do, how to do things right. It's growing at leaps and bounds. We put an enthusiastic young veterinarian in there. She's got about six years of experience. And she's just changing the world. So <clears throat> I know this thing works. The other R is rechecks. Recheck everything. This is also in the Bible. Thou shalt recheck everything in two weeks. <laughs> Not really, but do you guys always recheck in two weeks? Is there something about, maybe it's the suture removal interval or something, but my point is this. Um, I noticed that Dr. Snyder's revenue was a little higher than mine, you know, and I kept thinking, how does he do that? Well, I started looking. He rechecks everything, you know, every ear case, every, everything comes back in for a follow-up in a, in a given amount of time. And uh, so I learned from him on that, but it increases revenue, and then there's this exponential increase, and, and then they stop at the little toy area and buy a toy, and they pick up food and flea prevention. You know, you're trying to increase front door swing rate, right? And, um, and how much do you charge for that? Um, you know, some people don't charge anything. Some people charge a full exam. I kind of feel like somewhere in between is where you ought to be. I don't know what you guys do. A follow-up visit is, you know, about half of a regular examination, but that's up to you, um, depending on how much time you spend. Tiered pricing strategies is kind of an idea that Abaxis uh, puts forward because of the way the rotor system works. Um, that CDP is, a, I charge about $85 if I'm doing it for a sick dog or a first time if I'm screening. Um, if they come back, or if I use it for a pre-anesthetic and a dog that I, I want more values, I'll charge a little less for it. Or if it's a recheck, I'll charge about $49 if I'm doing it on a repeat. And, um, and so um, it increases compliance, and, and then, um, you know, when you find things, you do add-on services. But because clients are looking for, um, you know, better, better fee structure on that first slide I showed you, I think we need to really look at how we charge, and uh, we don't want to nickel and dime people to death, and we don't want to give things away for free either. But we need to find a price point that helps them comply. And, and even if you, it's a, like a lost leader for that Walmart. They'll do their free prescriptions to get you in the door. You know what I mean? So it's okay to, to adjust prices a little bit on those things to, to, to get the service because you're doing good medicine, and you might uncover something, and that in turn would you know, generate more revenue for you. Recalls are my, it's my least favorite R because I'm not a phone person. Very painful at times, that's for me. But you, should, you guys should really develop these five R's and have a staff meeting on each R and just strategize on how can we do recommendations better? How can we do recalls better? Um, you know, I have my staff call back my surgery patients. Uh, you know, if it's something that I need to explain to them, I'll call them back. But we, we call back for a lot of things. If, if you put them on a prescription food, you maybe call them back two or three days later and ask them how they're, how they're eating it. Because oftentimes they'll go home and Buffy won't eat it, and then they'll go out to the grocery store and buy something else. Well, they didn't eat that food you sold me. You know what I mean? But if you know it early on, you can intervene and maybe recommend something else or give them a trick to, to help them out. So the recalls does a lot of things. It strengthens that relationship. Um, it, it makes appointments. They, they make other appointments when you call them back and see how they're doing. Well, it's not doing so well. Well, we've got to recheck it. These R's feed themselves. Your reminder systems are the lifeblood of your practice. I think you guys probably know that. Pay close attention to them. The larger your practices get, um, the more reminders fall through the cracks. That's from that AHA study. 
you miss details. And so we remind for everything, phenobarb levels, glucose curves, uh, NSAID monitoring, anything that you can send a reminder for, send it. Weight loss programs, um, everything. Um, and we're starting to try to use some of that technology, maybe text and email, and we try to find out what the client wants, how they want to be reminded. Always tag wellness to your reminders. You know, stress the exam more than the vaccinations. Client recovery is close to my heart. <clears throat> my reception area, I don't like for clients to come in to the reception area and have a person talking on the phone and not greet the client within seconds. You know, there's research on that in human business and all that. So I designed my hospital, the reception area, there's actually three seats and three computer terminals. Sometimes I have two girls up front and, or three on really busy times. But my phone, my operator, the girl that answers majority of the phone calls, there's also a, a, a wall there, a, a, a fake wall or a wall with our logo and all that. And behind that are our files and her desk. She's out of sight. She answers the phone from back there and takes the majority of the calls. And the only time these girls answer the phone is if she's backed up. And gosh, it just makes a big difference um, in, in how clients perceive and how they're welcomed into the practice and all that. But um, anyway, that girl in the back, if she's not busy answering the phone, um, I like for her to start it with Mr. Adams and call Mr. Adams and ask him how Bozo and Buffy are doing. We're updating our records. I just want to see how, how they're doing. I noticed that um, they're overdue on their vaccinations and whatnot. Uh, you know, and you'd be amazed at how many appointments that girl generates. She more than pays for her salary just through the power of suggestion, a phone call. So if you're slow, if your practice isn't at capacity, you could hire someone to just do that. And when they get to Z, they go back to A and do it again. Because by the time they get to Z, things have changed. It takes a lot, well, it depends on how big your practice is. But um, so we have a phone person just that, that does that. Um, we have them get the new phone numbers, update their addresses, try to get email addresses. Um, it, it shows the clients that you care and it helps strengthen that relationship. All right, change. We've talked about this. It's just, it's, it's not an event. You're not going to go right back to your practices and just implement wellness and, and just have it. But I, I promise you, you can have results and see revenue differences within a few months. You can see differences in your computer on, on your recommendations. But I would suggest that you have strategic planning meetings with your staff. Take them off site somewhere and buy them dinner. Have them build the program, 80% of it. You tweak the final 20%. And it'll take a, time, take a lot of time for you to change the practice culture. But it, I know it can be done. All right, I'm closing with this. Um, Dr. Rotundo is actually a veterinarian from New York City. That He's the one that actually I heard the Captain Bravo joke from uh, several years ago at a meeting in San Diego. But he was well known for high quality practice and all that. But he and his young boy were traveling to upstate New York to go fishing or go so do something. And growing up in New York City, his little boy had never really been out in the country. And so when they got out in the rural roads, his little boy saw a cow standing beside the road. And um, <clears throat> his dad, the little boy said, Dad, look, a cow. His dad said, so? And it dawned on Dr. Rotundo that his little boy had never seen a cow. And it was a wow thing to his kid. And then they drove on a little further, and, and uh, there was a whole herd of cows over in the pasture. And uh, the little boy goes, Dad, look, wow, a whole bunch of cows. And Dr. Rotundo goes, yeah, that's really cool, you know. And you know, he's kind of feeling bad because his kid had never seen a cow. And he's a veterinarian. And uh, so they go over the knoll, and here stands a purple cow. And Dr. Rotundo and his both boy at the same time say, wow, a purple cow. And what that really means is you're not really in competition with other veterinarians in your area. You're in competition with anybody in your area in business that does a better job with customer service than you do. You have to continually show people the purple cow or the wow factor through customer service, client service. The, the, the little picture and, and text it, that all those little things that bond people to your practice. So I, I told that purple cow story and one of my receptionists bought a cow and painted it purple and it's sitting on the reception desk and right now it's dressed up in Halloween outfit or something. But 
but people come in and ask about the purple cow. And so uh, um, I think we just have to constantly remind ourselves that we need to continually uh, serve our, our clients and our patients. And uh, that's really all I have for this evening. And I appreciate your attention.